Hi guys, we're on July 8th of our Bible in Year Challenge reading, and today that is going to come from Nehemiah 1 through 3, Job 26, and 2 Corinthians 10. So, Nehemiah chapter 1. These are the memoirs of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. Nehemiah is concerned for Jerusalem. In late autumn of the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' raid, I was at the fortress of Susa. Hanani, one of my brothers, came to visit with me with some other men who had just arrived from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who had survived the captivity and about how things were going in Jerusalem. They said to me, Things are not going well for those who return to the province of Judah. They are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem has been torn down and the gates have been burned. When I heard this, I sat down and wept. In fact, for days I mourned, fasted, and prayed to the God of heaven. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of unfailing love with those who love him and obey his commands, listen to my prayer. Look down and see me praying night and day for your people Israel. I confess that we have sinned against you. Yes, even my own family and I have sinned. We have sinned terribly by not obeying the commands, laws, and regulations that you gave us through your servant Moses. Please remember... But you told your servant Moses, If you sin, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, even if you are exiled to the ends of the earth, I will bring you back to the place I have chosen for my name to be honored. We are your servants, the people you rescued by your great power and might. O oh Lord, please hear my prayer. Listen to the prayers of those of us who delight in honoring you. Grant, Please grant me success now as I go to ask the king for a great favor. Put it into his heart to be kind to me. In those days, I was the king's cupbearer. Chapter 2, Nehemiah goes to Jerusalem. Early the following spring, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never appeared sad in his presence before this time. So the king asked me, Why are you so sad? You aren't sick, are you? You look like a man with deep troubles. Then I was badly frightened, but I replied, Long live the king! Why shouldn't I be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been burned down. The king asked, Well, how could I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, If it please, if it please your majesty, and if you are pleased with me, your servant, send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. The king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked, How long will you be gone? When will you return? So the king agreed, and I set a date for my departure. I also said to the king, If it please your majesty, give me letters to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please send a letter to Asaph, the manager of the king's forest, instructing him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, for the city walls, and for the house, for... And for a house for myself and the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me when I came to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River I delivered the king's letter to them the king I should add had sent along army officers and horsemen to protect me but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite of official heard of my arrival they were very angry that someone had come who was interested in helping Israel. Nehemiah inspects Jerusalem's wall. Three days after my arrival at Jerusalem, I slipped out during the night, taking only a few others with me. I had not told anyone about the plans God had put in my heart for Jerusalem. We took no pack animals with us except the donkey that I myself was riding. I went out through the valley gate past the jackal's well and over to the dung gate to inspect the broken walls and burned gates. Then I went to the foundation gate into the king's pool. But my donkey couldn't get through the rubble, so I went up to the Kidron Valley instead, inspecting the wall before I turned back and entered again at the valley gate. The city officials didn't know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything or to anyone about my plans. I had not yet spoken to the religious and political leaders, the officials, or anyone else in the administration. But now I said to them, You know full well the tragedy of our city. It lies in ruins and its gates are burned. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and rid ourselves of this disgrace. Then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. They replied at once, Good, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. 
But but when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Jeshem, the Arab, heard of our plan, they scoffed contemptuously. What are you doing rebelling against the king like this? They asked. But I replied, the God of heaven will help us succeed. We, his servants, will start rebuilding this wall. But you have no stake or claim in Jerusalem. Chapter 3, Rebuilding the Wall of Jerusalem. Then Eliashib, the high priest, and the other priests started to rebuild at the Sheep Gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of Hundred, which they dedicated the Tower of Hananel. People from the city of Jericho worked next to them, and beyond them was Zachur, son of Imri. The fish gate was built by the sons of Hasena. They did the whole thing, laid the beams, hung the doors, and put the bolts and bars in place. Merimoth, son of Uriah, and grandson of Hakiz, repaired the next section of wall. Beside him were Meshalam, son of Berechiah, and grandson of Meshazabel, and then Zadok, son of Bana. Next were the people from Tekoa, though their leaders refused to help. The old city gate was repaired by Juada, son of Pasia, and Meshalam, son of Besodiah. They laid the beams, set up the doors, and installed the bolts and bars. Next to them were Melatiah from Gibeon, Jadon from Moranoth, and people from Gibeon and Mizpah, the headquarters of the governor of the province west of the Euphrates River. Next was Aziel, son of Harhiah, a goldsmith by trade, who also worked on the wall. Beyond him was Hananiah, a manufacturer of perfumes. They left out a section of Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephiah, son of Hur, the leader of half the district of Jerusalem, was next to them on the wall. Next, Jediah, son of Haramath, repaired the wall beside his own house. And next to him was Hadash, son of Hashabniah, who came, oh, then came Melchijah, son of Haram, and Hashab, son of Pahath Mob, who repaired the tower of the ovens, in addition to another section of the wall. Shalom, son of Halohesh, and his daughters repaired the next section. He was the leader of the other half of the district of Jerusalem. The people from Zenoa, led by Hanan, rebuilt the valley gate, hung its doors, and installed the bolts and bars. They also repaired the 1,500 feet of wall to the Dung Gate. The Dung Gate was repaired by Malkijah, son of Rechab, the leader of the Beth Hakarim district. After rebuilding it, he hung the doors and installed the bolts and bars. Shalom, son of Kol Hose, the leader of the Mizpah district, repaired the foundation gate. He rebuilt it, roofed it, hung its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Then he repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam near the king's garden, and he, re he rebuilt the wall as far as the stairs that descend from the city of David. Next to him was Nehemiah, son of Azbuk, the leader of half the district of Beth Zur. He rebuilt the wall to a place opposite the royal cemetery as far as the water reservoir and the house of the warriors. Next was a group of Levites working under the supervision of Rehum, son of Bani. Then came Hashabiah, the leader of the half district of Hila, who supervised the building of the wall on behalf of his own district. Next down the line were his countrymen, led by Binu, son of Henadad, the leader of the other half of the district of Kila. Next to them, Ezer, son of Jeshua, the leader of Mizpah, repaired another section of wall opposite the armory by the buttress. Next to him was Barach, son of Z Zabai, who repaired an additional section from the buttress to the door of the home of Eliash of the high priest. Merimoth, son of Uriah and grandson of Hazak, or son of Hakaz, Rebuilt another section of the wall extending from a point opposite the door of Eliashib's house to the side of the house. Then came the priests from the surrounding region. After them, Benjamin, Hashab, and Azariah, son of Messiah, and grandson of Ananiah, repaired the sections next to their, house, their own houses. Next was Binu, son of Henadad, who rebuilt another section of the wall from Azariah's house to the buttress of the corner. Palal, son of Uzai, Uzai carried on the work from a point opposite the buttress in the corner to the upper tower that projects from the king's house beside the court of the guard. Next to him were Padiah, son of Parash, and the temple servants living on the hill of Ophel, who repaired the wall as far as the water gate toward the east and the projecting tower. 
Then came the people of Tekoa, who repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower and over the wall of Ophel. The priests repaired the wall of the hill from the horse gate, each one doing the section immediately opposite his own house. Next, Zadok, son of Immer, also rebuilt the wall next to his own house, and beyond him was Shemaiah, son of Shechaniah, the gatekeeper of the east gate. Next, Hananiah, son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zal Zalaf, repaired another section, while Meshalam, son of Berechiah, rebuilt the wall next to his own house. Malkijah, son of the one of the Malkijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the wall as far as the housing for the temple service and merchants opposite the inspection gate. Then he continued as far as the upper room at the corner. The other goldsmiths and merchants repaired the wall from that corner to the sheep gate. Okay. So there's lots of people working on this wall. Lots and lots. Like an assembly line almost. They're all taking their sections. Okay. Job 26 is next. Job's ninth speech, a response to Bildad. Then Job spoke again. How you have helped the powerless. How you have saved a person who has no strength. How you have enlightened my stupidity. What wise things you have said. Where have you gotten all these wise sayings? Whose spirit speaks through you? The dead tremble in their place beneath the waters. The underworld is naked in God's presence. In God's presence. There is no cover for the place of destruction. God stretches the northern sky over empty space and hangs the earth on nothing. He wraps the rain in his thick clouds, and the clouds do not burst with the weight. He shrouds his throne with his clouds. He created the horizon when he separated the waters. He set the boundaries for day and night. The foundations of heaven tremble at his rebuke. By his power, the sea grew calm. By his skill, he crushed the giant sea monster. His spirit made the heavens beautiful, and his power pierced the gliding serpent. These are some of the minor things he does, merely a whisper of his power. Who can understand the thunder of his power? Okay, in 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians 10, Paul defends his authority. Okay. Now I, Paul, plead with you. I plead with the gentleness and kindness that Christ himself would use, even though some of you say I am bold in my letters but timid in person. I hope it won't be necessary, but when I come, I may have to be very bold with those who think we act from purely human motives. We are human, but we don't wage war with human plans and methods. We use God's mighty weapons, not merely worldly weapons, to knock down the devil's strongholds. With these weapons, we break down every proud argument that keeps people from knowing God. With these weapons, we conquer their rebellious ideas and we teach them to obey Christ. And we will punish those who remain disobedient after the rest of you become loyal and obedient. The trouble with you is that you make your decisions on the basis of appearance. You must recognize that we belong to Christ, just as those who proudly declare that they belong to Christ. I may seem to be boasting too much about the authority given to us by the Lord, but this authority is to build you up, not to tear you down, and I will not be put to shame by having my work among you destroyed. Now this is just this is not just an attempt to frighten you by my letters. For some say, Don't worry about Paul, his letters are demanding and forceful. But in person, he is weak, and his speeches are really bad. The ones who say this must realize that we will be just as demanding and forceful in person as we are in our letters. Oh, don't worry. I wouldn't dare say that I am as wonderful as these other men who tell you how important they are. But they are only comparing themselves with each other and measuring themselves by themselves. What foolishness. But we will not boast of authority we do not have. Our goal is to stay within the boundaries of God's plan for us, and this plan includes our working there with you. We are not going too far when we claim authority over you, for we were the first to travel all the way to you with the good news of Christ, nor do we claim credit for the work someone else has done. Instead, we hope that your faith will grow and that our work among you will be greatly enlarged. Then we will be able to go and preach the good news in other places that are far beyond you where no one else is working. Then there will be no question about being in someone else's territory. As the scriptures say, 
The person who wishes to boast should boast only of what the Lord has done. When people boast about themselves, it doesn't count for much. But when the Lord commends someone, that's different. That is all for July 8th. July, for July 9th, it says reflect on God as refuge. We'll see you next time.